Please rise. Who gives this woman to this man? So on behalf of Abby and Johnny, welcome to all of you for this very special occasion of their wedding. And we want to begin with singing words that you can find on the back of your program, Oh How Good It Is. There are two stanzas there in a chorus. We'll sing the words of Oh How Good It Is all together and we we'll remain standing for the singing. So we want to call upon the Lord in prayer, and in our prayer we will pray for Crew to harm to Harmsel, was one of the ring bearers, but he is in the hospital with uh, asthma, breathing-related issues, and so we'll pray for him uh, that he may be well. Let us come to God in prayer. Lord our God, how good it is that we may be together for this very special day. 
the wedding of Abby and Johnny. We thank you, Lord, for them and for how you have made them, how you have blessed them in life, how you have brought them to meet each other and to begin to love each other and to want to be married to each other. And now on this special day that may be formalized, they will, they will repeat their vows and we will witness that and, Lord, it will be also before you. And so will you help them? Will you help them, Lord, to not just say, not just make their promise, but also to live it out? And will you give them grace in your Holy Spirit to that end? We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your promises. We thank you that you are a Savior and Redeemer, God, and that we may look to you for all that we need for this life and for the life to come. Indeed, how we must look to you. We thank you that this wedding, too, may be a wedding in the name of the Lord. And we pray, therefore, that you will be glorified in all that takes place. Also, when the word of God is opened and read and proclaimed, we pray, bless it by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for everyone who is with us, for each family and friend that is represented here, and Lord, for all the love and care that surround Abby and Johnny, all the attendants, the parents, the grandparents, the generations, and the covenant communities. We praise you, Lord, for these great gifts. We also think of those who are listening online, and we pray for them for joining us in spirit, and we pray as well for Crew, the son of Ben and Courtney, we pray for him in the hospital as he cannot be here, as the family would love him to be here. We thank you that he is receiving good care and that so far he is well. We pray for healing, mercies for him, and strength for his parents. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you will be with them in this tender time. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. While we are gathered here as congregations of our Lord Jesus Christ with family and friends to witness the confirmation of the marriage of Abigail Hope Van Vliet and Jonathan Morris Van Dyke. It is good that marriage be confirmed in such a gathering and that God's blessing be asked to rest upon it. The Lord God reveals to us in his word that he has created man and woman and destined them for each other, giving them the gift and calling of marriage and promising his blessing on it. Scripture teaches us that God our Father, who created heaven and earth and all that is therein, created man in his image. Male and female, he created them. He also said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And God blessed them, and God said, be fruitful and multiply. This excellent gift of God has been blemished by man's fall into sin. But God, who is great in mercy, has been pleased to restore the unity of marriage and to confirm his blessing. For that reason, our Lord Jesus Christ has honored marriage as an institution of his heavenly Father by his presence and miracles at the marriage at Cana. He also condemned the breaking of the marriage bond when he said, Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. In the apostolic teaching of the New Testament, marriage is recognized as a gift of God and sanctified through the word of God and through prayer. The apostle calls the unity in marriage a great mystery which he relates to the unity between Christ and the church. For these reasons, the married state ought not to be lightly or thoughtlessly entered into, but with reverence and thankfulness and in the fear of the Lord. The bond of marriage for all of life may thus be a matter of joy in which man and wife receive love and faithfulness from each other, assistance and dedication. Because of sin, married people also experience much trouble and affliction. Nevertheless, you may, as he has promised, be assured of the grace and help of the Lord, and that you and your marriage may live according to the commandments of God, and trusting in his promises, you ought to know for what reasons God has instituted marriage. In the first place, marriage is instituted in order that man and wife, joined together in true love, may belong to each other, in joy, and may faithfully help each other in all things which belong to earthly and eternal life. In the second place, through marriage, the human race and also the church of the Lord are built. If it pleases God to give you children, you are to raise and guide them in the knowledge and fear of the Lord. Further, let every man live with his wife and let every woman live with her husband in accordance with the will of God and with a clear conscience so that our bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit be not defiled. Next, you are to hear from the word of God how you are to behave towards each other in the married state. 
Johnny, the man, the husband, has been appointed by God to be the head of his wife, and he shall love his wife as Christ loves his church. You must lead your wife and comfort her, serve her and protect her, even as Christ is the consolation and assistance to his church. Abby, as wife, you shall be subject to your husband, even as the church is subject to Christ. You must love him and serve him, your husband. Follow him and care for the family with him and display the adornment of a meek and quiet spirit. According to the commandment of God, both of you shall do your work with faithfulness and dedication. You shall understand that your family is part of a larger community and that you have a calling with respect to church and society. Live in the fear of the Lord. Remember that you are heirs of the grace of life. Be forgiving and live together in wisdom that your prayers be not hindered. So then, Johnny and Abby, having understood that God has instituted marriage and what he commands you therein, do you declare before God and his holy church that it is your sincere intention to live in this holy state after this manner, and do you desire that your marriage be now solemnized? What is your answer, Johnny and Abby? The Lord God confirm your intention which he has given you, and may the beginning of your marriage be in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. This time I will now have you say your vows to each other. I, Jonathan Morris Van Dyke, do solemnly declare before God, in this is Holy Church, that I take to myself and acknowledge as my wife, Abigail Hope Van Vliet, here present. I promise that I will, with the gracious help of God, love, honor, and maintain you, and live with you in the holy bonds of marriage according to God's ordinance. I promise to be your husband, I promise to be your husband for, better or for, worse, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, for richer or for poorer in, sickness and in, health, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, to love and, to cherish and, I promise never to you, and I promise never to forsake you from this day forward, this day forward and, until death do us part. and until death do us part. I, Abigail Hope Van Vliet, to solemnly declare before God, to solemnly declare before God, and this is Holy Church, and this is Holy Church, that I take to myself, that I take to myself, and acknowledge as my husband, and acknowledge as my husband, Jonathan Morris Van Dyke here present, Jonathan Morris Van Dyke here present, I promise that I will, I promise that I will, with the gracious help of God, with the gracious help of God, love, honor, and obey you in all things lawful, love, honor, and obey you in all things lawful, and live with you in the holy bonds of marriage. And live with you in the holy bonds of marriage, according to God's ordinance. According to God's ordinance. I promise to be your wife. I promise to be your wife. For better or for worse. For better or for worse. For richer or for poor. For richer or for poor. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. And I promise never to forsake you. And I promise never to forsake you. From this day forward. From this day forward. And until death do us part. And until death do us part. In accordance with the ordinances of God and by the civil authority vested upon me by the province of Ontario, I now pronounce you Johnny and Abby, husband and wife. The Father of all mercies, who by his grace called you to this holy state of marriage, bind you in true love and faithfulness and grant you his blessing. Amen. It's now time for you to exchange rings. Johnny, do you give this ring to Abby as a token of your constant faithfulness and abiding love? I do. And Abby, do you give this ring to Johnny as a token of your constant faithfulness and abiding love? And Johnny, you may kiss your bride. Hear now from the gospel how firm the bond of marriage is, as described in Matthew 19, 3 to 9. The Pharisees came to Jesus, tempting him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why did Moses then command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. Believe these words of Christ and be certain and assured that your Lord God has joined you together in this holy state. You are therefore to receive whatever befalls you therein with patience and thanksgiving as from the hand of God. And so all things will turn to your advantage and salvation. Amen. Considering that we have no good of ourselves and that all good gifts come from above, from the Father of lights, you are asked now to kneel before the face of the Lord so that the congregation may pray with you and for you. So what we're going to do at this time is sing, first of all, from Psalm 134. And during the singing of the first stanza, you find that the words on the back of your program, during the singing of the first stanza, the couple will be seated, or sorry, the wedding party will be seated and the couple will kneel. And then we will pray. And after we have prayed together, we will stand to sing stanza two. So only stanza one, the couple kneels and the wedding party may be seated. Let us pray. Merciful God and Father, you have brought this bride and bridegroom, Abby and Johnny, together, and you have united them to the bond of marriage. We thank you for the blessing given to them that they may go through life together under your care. Grant them this grace that through the love of Christ they may more and more grow towards each other, bound together in the unity of the true faith. Grant them the strength of your Holy Spirit enabling them as husband and wife to live together in their family according to your holy will. Grant them your favor that should it please you to give them children, they may raise them in accord with the promises and demands of your covenant in the instruction, discipline, and love of Christ. Sanctify the tie that binds them to their blessing, to the edifying of your church as a witness to others and to the glory of your holy name. Hear us, Father of all mercy, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, our Lord, in his name we conclude our prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Congregation, please stand and let's sing stanza two. may be seated. And just before you stand, Johnny and Abby, it's always good to impress this moment on your mind and heart and your memory and the dependence that it reflects. Your help must be in the name of the Lord, and you reflect that help when you call upon Him. Sometimes kneel. It's not the kneeling that's the most important, but it's the spirit of humble dependence. The Lord bless you as you look to Him. You may stand. There's one more reading, the promise of God in Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. For you shall eat the labor of your hands. Happy shall you be, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine by the sides of your house, your children like olive plants 
around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. We may now present you with a wedding gift from the congregation, the first uh, Bible for the two of you, and I would like to call on your uncle, Abby, Elder Henry Vanerveen, to make that presentation. Well, I am the favorite uncle, right? Yeah. At least that's what you told Aunt Jackie. <laughs> so there's two presentations on the program. One is... Um, for the Bible, the other is coming up when the pastor will, you, will present you to us as a new couple. And thankfully, we can say with this Bible, uh, in one sense, it's not new to you. You've been raised with it in your homes. And just thinking today about our kids, too, that uh, maybe when you cleaned up your, your rooms and uh, went through your cupboards in a closet and you found numerous copies of the Bible from Sunday school, from graduations, and and now here, a brand new one for your married life. And so we can thankfully say that and encourage you that you continue in this from what you've learned at home, from your parents and your family. And uh, this is the wish of Vineland. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the congregation and consistory, and we want to encourage you in that as well. So congratulations and the Lord's blessing. Thank you, Henry. This time we'll have the couple sign the register in the bands and uh, ask your two attendants to come forward as well. And during this time, there'll be some music playing. Once again, we will sing together now the words of the last number on the back of your program, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. There are two stanzas there that we will sing, 
and a chorus. And let's uh, stand to sing and remain standing afterwards for the votum and salutation as we draw near to worship the Lord. So please rise. One of the first things, or the first thing that a married couple does in our church and church tradition is to worship the Lord with family and friends. So as we draw near to worship God, we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, and in Christ Jesus is an overflowing fountain of good. Amen. Congregation, receive the greeting of the Lord, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. And I invite you to open your Bibles to a rather obscure Old Testament prophet, Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3. If you need a page number in your pew Bibles, it's page 831. 831, and we will read together from Zephaniah 3, verse 14 through 17. The main text will be 17, though all of what we read together will come into view. But Zephaniah 3, beginning at verse 14, the Word of God. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear. Zion, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Well, dear Abby and Johnny, together with all your family and friends, and members of various congregations. The text that's before us, let me just explain how we got here. A few weeks ago, we met and talked about today and different things, and I said, any thoughts about a text? And you mentioned this one, Zephaniah 3, 17, and then 
we talked a bit, and then you said you'd let me decide. So at first I thought, this is a beautiful text, but is it a wedding text? And I didn't know. And so what I did is I looked all over the Bible and thought about this text and that text, and I just couldn't make up my mind. And time after time, I came back to this. And then it was decision time, and I chose what you had suggested. And as it turns out, I'm so glad I did. And I hope by the end of the sermon, you will think the same. Above all, we need God's blessing, and we pray for that. But what I discovered as I studied and prepared for this message, what I discovered was that in so many ways, this is the perfect text for the two of you. I've tried to put my message together in a way that hopefully you will never forget it so long as you both shall live. The first thing to be clear about is what it's about, the text. When the Lord says, verse 17, Now the Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I'm sure we can all sense that this is a very rich text. Someone has said that with these words, we enter, in a way, into the holy of holies, in terms of God expressing his love for his people. And really, it's exactly about that, his great love for his people. And we don't have time to get into all the details of the context. Uh, Let me just say that Zephaniah had to bring a a stern message, a, a message of judgment to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And it was because of their sin as often the prophets had to address the sin of the people and and threaten the judgment of God. A day is coming, the prophet talks about in chapter 1, that will not be easy, will be awful even, for every hard-hearted, unrepentant sinner. The Lord will judge the wicked. The Lord will destroy even the wicked. And that's very sobering and reason even to tremble if we are living in sin. If we don't turn to the Lord, and if that should be anyone here, even this afternoon, if you don't turn, how great your judgment will be. Zephaniah is unmistakably clear about that. But what about the people of God? What about those who have learned by grace to fear Him and trust Him? Earlier in chapter 3, we can read about the meek and the humble, the remnant who walk in God's ways. What about them? Well, here's what Zephaniah says so richly and plainly. God will save you. God will save you. And ultimately, these words and this text that we read is a prophecy of that, and it's a prophecy of the Lord doing exactly that through the sending of His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus come into the world to save His people from their sin, so much so that He will now even live with His people through His Spirit and someday take His people to be home with Him in glory. And what the text And your text particularly describes is how glad and happy the Lord is to do that. Listen again to these words. The Lord, your God in your midst. There always have to be some special memories in a wedding. (laughs) The Lord, your God in your midst, says Zephaniah, he will save, he will rejoice over you with gladness, he will quiet you with his love, he will rejoice over you with singing. Now, these are tremendous words. They are about the Lord so excited, as it were, to save His people and to be with them and to enjoy them because He loves them. He loves His people so very much. And that's what the text is about. And you need to understand that at the outset. The Lord loves His people very much. But how now does that relate to the two of you? All of us, but especially the two of you. How does it relate to what just happened for you and with you? Well, today, obviously, you've gotten married. And just a few moments ago, you became husband and wife. And already that is very special. And what is more, you have done so as confessing Christian believers. And so you have married, in that sense, in the Lord. And that's very important because what you need now to go forward is the Lord. You don't need Him just to get married. You need Him to be married and to live married. Really, that's the only way to make it in life altogether, just by yourself, but all the more so when when you become a couple. Marriage, of course, brings many blessings. We know that, and you are looking forward to that. Marriage also includes, at times, various challenges. No matter how much you love each other, challenges will come because we are sinful and weak, and this world is hard. 
And so the outstanding question is, how will you do together? How will you make it? How will you thrive even as a married couple? And the answer, according to the Scripture, is look to the Lord. Ever and always look to Him. That means for all of us in all of our life, too, we need to trust the Lord and follow the Lord. We need to respect His Word. We need to respect His day. We need, we need to seek in all things that He be praised and glorified. And, and when we do that, when that's our spirit and our, our focus, then also in view of this text, what you may know is that you look to the Lord who loves you so much because He loves all His people so much. And how encouraging that's meant to be as you go from here to look to the God who loves you so much. Well, that's the text, and that's how it relates. And now for the rest of the message, I want, I want to draw from the text and from the verses around it and highlight three ways, especially for you to look to the Lord. Three details involved with looking to Him. And the first one is to look to Him joyfully, to be joyful. Because notice the passage, the way it begins back in 14, verse 14, when the prophet says, Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. And he's addressing the church, and of course every Christian then, sing, shout, be glad, he says, rejoice with all your heart. And you know what he's calling for is enthusiastic praise and delight for the Lord. Why? What's the reason? Well, he makes clear the reason is that the judgment is past, and the enemies who would be the agent of judgment are gone. Verse 15, the Lord has taken away your judgment. Now, that had particular application to the time of the prophet, but ultimately it was a prophecy of what the Lord would do someday through Jesus Christ. When He would come and He would bear the punishment that we deserve for our sin, when He would be crucified, when He would hang on that cross and be forsaken even, so that our sin, all who turn to Him, our sin may be washed away, and our judgment may be put away. Isn't that what happened at Calvary? Isn't that what happened when Jesus died? The Lord took away the judgment of his people. He took it away, and he will never bring it back. He judged sin at Calvary, and for his people, he will never judge it again. And that's why the prophet says, be glad. He has some insight into this, and he says, shout and rejoice and sing. That's why we may look to the Lord joyful, full of joy. Yes, even when things are difficult in life. And sometimes they can be. Yet on account of God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ and the pardon of every sin we've committed and will commit, and that we may live in hope of eternal life, there is the secret to true and lasting joy. Notice the end of verse 15. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. What does that mean? Does that mean there will be no trouble for believers in life? No, it doesn't mean that. We know there is trouble in life. The, the Lord has warned us of that. In this life, there will be tribulation for the sake of our faith and because the world is broken and we are sinners still. There will be trial and trouble and also in marriage, that may be, and you will meet that, no doubt. But the Christian hope with which we live and the Christian hope to which we cling and the Christian hope which also binds you together and what can help you so always to rejoice is that you live in anticipation of the day when you will see disaster no more. No more trouble, no more pain, no more suffering, no more hardship. Never. That is a promise the people of God hold close. And that is a promise that enables the people of God to rejoice always. How different from the people of this world so many of whom live in constant fear of some new trial or trouble or disaster. And when disaster falls, they have no resources with which to cope. And most of all are facing endless disaster under God's judgment. Oh, how rich believers may be, how God's people are blessed beyond belief even. Left to ourselves in the most trying of circumstances, we can still rejoice because we have been delivered and we have hope of glory. And so the prophet is teaching the people of God to look to Him, to look to God, joyful. Let joy mark your life, he is saying. And then second, second, we may look to Him amazed. Amazed. Why amazed? 
Well, here let me highlight the words of the main text, verse 17. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. So just notice how close he is. In your midst, among you, with you. Even through the Spirit of God, we may know in us. That's already amazing, isn't it? Especially in view of what we deserve as sinners. How can it be that God does this for us? That He saves us, that He, he lives with us, that He comes even to be among us and in us. That's already amazing. But that's not nearly all of it. Because the text goes on to say, still the most amazing things. All about how the Lord will rejoice over you with gladness. And He will quiet you with His love. And He will rejoice over you with singing. Now there are three lines there. And the middle one is about how the Lord will quiet you with His love. It means He will calm you. He will make you still. He will, he will fill you with peace. He will give you rest, all in the arms of His love, as it were. And with His love and through His love, I mean, Zephaniah is trying to help us how the Lord, help us understand how the Lord will love us so. And that's already incredibly amazing, but then the two outside lines make it even more so. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will rejoice over you with singing. I don't think we can hardly understand what's being conveyed here. But the language that the prophet uses through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit points to the joy of the heart of God as he takes delight in his people. He doesn't just save so he can have them somewhere, not too close, not too far, but just somewhere. He has a heart that is so intent on saving his people, he will bring them close to him where he can take joy and pleasure in them and where he can even sing over them. Such is the ecstasy we might say, of the divine heart. Yes, what is being described here is enough to take our breath away. How much the Lord loves the people of God when we believe in Him and belong to Him. He loves us so much that He will sing over us. When do we sing? We sing when we're lighthearted and free. And He sings because He has saved His people so that He can be with His people so that we can be with Him. And the point is, what else is there to do about this but be amazed? This God is amazing. And as we look to Him, and as you look, Johnny and Abby, as you go forward looking to Him, be in awe and worship and adore and say again and again how amazing, how amazing that He loves us, that He loves to be with us and delight in us. And sing over us. What makes this all the more amazing is when we think about who we are by nature and what we are sometimes like. And maybe we can't stand each other. That can happen in life, can't it? Even in the most intimate relationships. How many wives have had moments where they say about their husbands or even to their husbands, you drive me crazy with the way you talk or with what you do or something. And how many husbands too may have moments when they say about their wives or to their wives, I don't understand you. I don't have a clue what you're thinking. We can have that, right, where we have difficulties together and, and more even when we know ourselves. Who doesn't know about not being able to stand even themselves? These are the realities with which we deal every day in human relationships. But the Lord says, never mind that. I can stand you. I can stand you. And, and more even, I love you. And I delight in you. And I sing over you. If you're, not, if you're not amazed, you're not understanding or you're not listening. How can it get any more amazing? And let's seek then to be ever and always amazed. As I was reflecting on this, I was reminded of how this has been expressed in Christian hymnody in various ways. Some of these you will recognize. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. In glad amazement, Lord, I stand amidst the bounties of thy hand. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, 
shouldst die for me. My point is, Johnny and Abby and all of us, look to God. Look to Him ever and always amazed. Seek for that, that spirit of awe and wonder over His love. And then one more thing. Look to Him joyful. Look to Him amazed. And look to Him vigorous. Vigorous. What does vigorous mean? Well, it's a word that means eager and active and energetic and forceful. Sometimes we go for a vigorous walk or a vigorous run. No sloughing off, right? No holding back. That's the idea behind vigorous. So why do we say, look to the Lord vigorous? Well, this has to do with eagerness and readiness to serve Him, to trust Him and love Him and walk with Him and be faithful to Him and live for His glory and praise. We ought to be vigorous Christians, not half-hearted, not timid, not holding back. And why? Well, the reason is in verse 16. In that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear. Zion, let not your hands be weak. See, the church of Zephaniah's day had to hear hard news. They were being told tough times are coming. Judgment is on the horizon. And it can happen with news like that that we become paralyzed or immobilized. Ever had it that fear, anxiety, Weakness grips your heart and, and all the strength goes out of your body. Maybe you know what that's like. If you're facing a hard time and you think about it long enough, you can, you can become down and discouraged. You may be even tempted to quit. It's too hard to serve the Lord. It's too hard to press forward in difficult times in life, in marriage. We just can't do it. Who doesn't understand that? Sometimes it is hard. But with this insight and with this perspective, with this revelation to all true believers that God loves you so much that He's planning even to sing over you to all eternity, what that is meant is to help overcome any and every temptation to quit. And even to work in you, to stir in you a resolve to say, all right, it's hard, it's challenging, whatever it is, but we can do this. If you have so great a God and so great a salvation and such amazing grace, we can do what He tells us. We can go where He sends us. We can live in the place that He sets us down. We can submit to every providence. In His shepherding care, He takes us through. What's His word to you? Don't be afraid. Let not your hands be weak. And that's true for you and that's true for us with whatever God calls us to do. Vigorous. Are we vigorous? How this text is meant to help us. And, of course, none of this we can do ourselves. It should drive us to prayer. Lord, in light of this word, help us look to you joyful, amazed, and vigorous. That's a good prayer. Help us look to you joyful, amazed, and vigorous. And Johnny and Abby, just so you never forget, This text and this message, I've I've put it together in a way that it reflects your new name. Maybe you've caught that. I'm not sure. Maybe not. But just in case you haven't, Johnny and Abby Van Dyke, J-A-B, joyful, amazed, vigorous, J-A-B. You can't forget now. To your last days together, until glory. The Lord calls you to look to Him because He loves you so much in and through Jesus. And so look to him joyful, amazed, and vigorous. And you know, as you do that, you'll be blessed together. And you'll be a blessing beyond among your family and friends in your church and even in the world. We look forward to seeing that all by his grace and to his glory. Let's pray. Lord our God, mighty Savior, You who are pleased to come to us and to live among us who deserve only your judgment. Lord, we marvel at your grace and we pray that we may receive your grace in and through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was judged so we might be set free, all who turn to him and trust in him. And grant, Lord, that every one of us here also may be among those who are meek and humble, who have turned to you and who trust in you. And use even this word to help with that and to strengthen that. 
Grant, Lord, especially to Johnny and Abby, grace to look to you going forward with joy and amazement and full of vigor and strength to serve you wherever you will lead them and however you will be pleased to use them. We thank you for your word, which is profitable, and we pray that it may be so for us also today. We thank you again that for a few moments we could be under the means of grace. We pray, bless the word by the power of the Holy Spirit. Bless also the rest of the day, all of the joy and rejoicing and family time and friendships. We pray, Lord, that you will keep us in your care, and we pray that we may glorify you in all things. Hear our prayer, we pray, for Jesus' sake alone. Amen. Now I invite you to take the Psalter books in the pews and turn to Psalter number 7. Psalter number 7, we'll sing this, all three stanzas, uh, we'll sing this standing, and then also after the benediction, 403 stanza 3 as our doxology. So Psalter 7, all the stanzas, and then 403 stanza 3. Please stand. Receive now the blessing of the Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
Johnny and Abby, if you can come forward. And while they're just getting settled here, I just want to mention that there will be a receiving line just outside the sanctuary towards the fellowship hall. And you're given the opportunity to congratulate the couple and their parents and then to proceed to the hall for refreshments. And we hope that you will make use of that and enjoy some fellowship together. It's now my great privilege to present to you for the first time Mr. and Mrs. Johnny and Abby Van Dyke. <laughs> 